I am Dr. Charles Gieschen here at Concordia Theological Seminary, and I'm privileged to discuss the Christmas Day Gospel reading uh, with you, namely from the prologue of the Gospel of John, John chapters 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. I'd like to say right at the beginning that um, there are a few verses, namely verses 6 through 8, that actually were part of the Advent 3 uh, gospel lesson that if you preached on the gospel lessons the last few, few weeks, you preached on that section of the prologue. And it's about John the Baptist witness. I would, I'm not going to discuss that this morning, given our, uh, today, given our limited time, uh, but rather give you um, uh, most of our attention to the verses preceding, namely verses 1 through 4. Five, and then the verses that follow. And this is especially because the fo focus on Christmas Day is on the incarnation, the mystery of the Word becoming flesh. So the pre-existence of the Son, and then the Son becoming flesh uh, and, and um, tabernacling with us, that's the focus of your preaching, not so much John the Baptist as it was a few weeks ago in Advent 2 and 3. Also, one other point in introducing this text is all of us as pastors have preached on Christmas Eve, Luke chapter 2, and then the next day we're preaching again on the, mist, on the, uh, the reality of, of Jesus being born by preaching from John chapter 1. How are those messages different? Well, obviously, the text focus on two uh, distinct things, namely, the event of Luke chapter 2 is the birth of Jesus as the long-awaited king of David, born in Bethlehem, uh, as the Savior, versus the prologue of John that you're preaching from on Christmas Day that we're looking at right now, which is focusing on the pre-existence of the Son, that his origins aren't found just in the Davidic line and uh, not just in the birth in Bethlehem, but his origins are found in the mystery of the one God because he is also the eternal son who then becomes flesh. So focusing on Christmas Eve, on the birth of Jesus as the, as the Messiah, as the Davidic king come to save his people, uh, versus on Christmas Day focusing on one of the ultimate mysteries of the Christian faith, that God, namely the Son, would become also man, uh, flesh, in order to save us. And so it's that uh, focus that we'll have as we look at John chapter 1. And let's go to the text. Uh, right away, you see the significance of this gospel in connecting itself with uh, the Old Testament with the very opening words, uh, NRK. Uh, NRK are the same words used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the Septuagint, namely the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so you see here that John understands the significance of what happened when, when God became also a man, born Jesus of Nazareth, as having its origins long before nine months um, uh, with the... In, with the uh, um, the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary, Mary, but rather his origins go way back to prior to creation. You have Luke and Matthew having birth narratives. John's gospel gives us the pre-existence of the Son prior to creation. And we see that with the, the close tie with Genesis chapter 1. But then uh, you have a unique title given to the Son in this opening verse. Three times uh, you have the phrase ha-logos used. And that, I would argue, is a title for the Son that is actually drawing on another title that we see in the Old Testament, which is the fact that sometimes God's visible appearances are given the title, The Word of the Lord. There's other titles used for God's visible appearances, such as the angel of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the name of the Lord. But by the time of the first century, there were Jews that reduced all of these various titles for God's visible 
form in the Old Testament to this simple title, the Logos. And so it's a title of, for God's visible form that uh, was active towards his creation. And what John is saying is, the Son is none other than this one who is the Word, who existed prior to creation. That's brought out by the fact that he existed in the beginning, so he's within the mystery of God. Matter of fact, he is present with God. You can understand this uh, in the sense of he is present with the Father. Uh, so often the, the Apostle Paul uses the title Theos for the Father and the term Kyrios uh, for the Son. One could say the Word is the Son who existed with um, uh, the Father. And then you have, you have also then the Word was God. Very, very important statement of the fact that, that the Son is within the mystery of the one God of Israel. He isn't just some kind of agent of God, but he is one with God. You have a beautiful expression here of Trinitarian theology, the unity uh, within the, um, the Son as within the mystery of the one God of Israel with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, this one, namely the Word, was in the beginning. You have a restatement of verse 1 in verse 2. So this one was in the beginning. Notice the parallelism between these two phrases. Was in the beginning with God. He existed prior to creation. So Jesus is not a created being. He is within the mystery of the one eternal God uh, as the eternal Son. To point this out very um, strongly, it, uh, the text emphasizes that all things came to be through him. So the emphasis is that it wasn't that, um, that somehow he comes into being as part of the creation. No, he is the creator that actually was the agent through which God brought about creation. And I would say uh, it's not just the fact of he is somehow just God speaking. He's actually the son is the one that through whom things came to be. Uh, that's what it says, through him. And then uh, it's stated very positively in the first part of verse um, 3, and then in, in an in a opposite way, without him. So here the agency. Through him all things came to be. Without him came to be not one thing. You have the number there, which came to be. Notice here that the punctuation in your Greek text sometimes has a period and emphasizing that this prepositional phrase should be taken with verse 4. I think a better way to understand it is the way I've laid it out here. Namely, this prepositional phrase actually ends this sentence in verse 3 rather than beginning verse 4. Uh, so the emphasis is, uh, the Son, the Logos, is the Creator. He is on the divine side of the line between Creator and cre creation. He is within the mystery of the one God of Israel. Then verse 4, uh, in him was life. A new idea introduced here, namely Zoe, very important theme in John. Uh, only one being is the source of life, and that is the God of Israel. Uh, to say that in him, namely in the Logos, is life, is to say he is none other than one of one essence with the God of Israel. He is uh, eternal because only God is the source of life and he, that's shown in the creation. And the life was the light of men. Here, uh, calling to mind even the creation narrative where you have light overcoming darkness that sets up the whole understanding of how when Jesus uh, is actually born, he is that light coming into the world of darkness, of sin, and overcoming it. So just as in the beginning the sun brought light through um, creating it that overcame the darkness of the chaos, uh, and, and brought order and creation, so also he will do the same through his incarnation. 
bringing light and overcoming the darkness of sin. All of that is so, sort of set up here in verses 4 and 5 where you have the emphasis that he was the light of man and the light shines, present tense, shines in the darkness and the darkness um, cannot overcome it. So you have the emphasis of how the sun as the source of light um, uh, brings light uh, over creation uh, at the beginning and he will even more so one might say through his incarnation through coming into the the world that's been darkened by sin. Now skipping over uh, these verses let's scroll up to uh, verse 9 and you have the um, this important testimony right here uh, to the fact that um, the true light, uh, and here we have a paraphrastic construction. Uh, the ain right here actually relates to this participle. So uh, you can just get to the subject here. The true light, uh, with the adjective modifying the the noun here, uh, which enlightens, picking up from the verses that we looked at uh, just above, which enlightens all men, uh, was coming. So instead of having just an imperfect tense verb, you actually have an imperfect tense form of I, me, with the present participle here. Again, a paraphrastic construction just uh, Sometimes people see the verb and the participle separated and don't realize how they function together. But basically you have your subject and then you have your verb functioning with the participle as a paraphrastic instruction. Was coming into the world. Here the emphasis I would argue is how um, the eternal son uh, was active in the world, was coming into the world, especially through the incarnation. Okay, And that's brought out in the, the mystery of these verses right here. But you have John the Baptist testified to, so the natural connection with verse 9 is that the was coming into the world is the mystery of God becoming also man the light of the world becoming uh, into the world in the form of the person of Jesus. And notice how it, uh, it expresses this. He was in the world, and the world was, came to be right here uh, through him, came to be through him, and, um, and the world did not know him. Namely, he's the creator, and yet the creation doesn't recognize their creator. Uh, this, I think, is uh, testifying especially to how um, Jesus was rejected uh, by his own. Uh, but one can say this isn't, uh, isn't a new pattern. It happened in the Old Testament, too. The creator came to his creation and was often rejected. But climactically, that rejection happens when God became man and came into this world. Look at verse 11. He came into his own, and here uh, the understanding of um, uh, probably uh, his own people, uh, namely he came to Israel, and his own did not receive him. Uh, again, uh, the rejection of of uh, the Messiah, the rejection of the Savior of the world is all testified there. Uh, and then verse 12, but to the ones who, re whoever received him, uh, there is a, an understanding of receiving as in the passive reception by faith. To whoever, whoever believed in him, he gave the authority uh, to become children of God. Here this language of children of God has a, a lot to do with John chapter 3 being begotten from above and, and becoming uh, children of God, namely being given that birth from above. Uh, here it says, to the ones who have believed in his name, right here, 
a very interesting phrase in the sense that it's not just believed in him, but believed in his name. To the ones who believed who the Son was, namely that he was none other than the Lord, none other than Yahweh himself, none other than the Creator who had made all things, who had now come. To the ones who believed in his name, uh, and he, became, he gave power to become children of God. And then it stresses that this birth is not from uh, blood, namely, or, namely not from being a Jew, not from the desire of the flesh. Um, uh, here probably um, referencing the fact of circumcision uh, or not from the desire of a man, namely trying to be obedient to the Torah, that was not how people became children of God, but they became children of God by being begotten uh, of God. That's a shorthand for what we see in John chapter 3. God gives the birth from above. It's a beautiful testimony to what we would uh, call uh, God's grace, monergism. God brings us to faith. It's that, that, that getting from above. Uh, but the main thing that I think one would focus in on Christmas Day is this stark mystery testified to in verse 14. And the Logos, that eternal Son who is the Creator, became flesh. And uh, notice it doesn't just emphasize he appeared as a man. Uh, or he, uh, like an angel taking on a temporary manifestation uh, as, a, as a man. No, he becomes flesh. He unites himself with his creation. So you have the creator becoming part of his creation. Uh, this whole text testifies to how valuable creation is. God brought this about and God loved his creation, loved each of us so much that he shares in our creation through the Son becoming also flesh. And uh, this, this text, like few in Scripture, testify to the ongoing value of all of God's creation, including our bodies. One of the, the beautiful terms here is this uh, Greek term, eskenosin, uh, here, um, skeno, skenao, and uh, it's basically a, a um, an ao contract verb. You have skenao uh, as a term in the Old Testament that speaks of how the glory of God dwelt. It literally means to dwell, also sometimes translated tabernacle because it was the glory that dwelt in the tabernacle. So sometimes it's uh, helpful to bring that out in the translation of John 1 verse 14 by saying the, the word became flesh and tabernacled. It's a term used in the Old Testament in the Septuagint, the Greek version, to speak about how the glory dwelt in the tabernacle. So also how the glory tabernacled with Israel, now this same one, the eternal Son, is dwelling or tabernacling with us. Beautiful testimony to the fact that you have the incarnation, just as, not as a temporary thing. Jesus didn't just become man for 33 years and then give it up but he is eternally tabernacling because he has become flesh for the rest of eternity. He's eternally tabernacling with men. And we have beheld eyewitness testimony. That's John, the apostle, saying we have beheld his glory. Very important term here. Calls to mind the Old Testament testimony of how the glory of the Lord um, was seen by Moses and then enters the tabernacle, later it enters the temple. And so that very same son who was present with Israel now has taken on flesh and, and John says, we have beheld his glory. 
Uh, so it's very much connected in with the Old Testament, where one of the titles of God's visible appearance in the Old Testament is the glory. Glory is of the only begotten. Uh, monogenes, a very important term in John. It's the, um, the only begotten in the sense of there aren't, he's not the first in, in, of many. He is the one and unique uh, son, so um, the only begotten from the Father, again, the, the Trinitarian, both the distinction uh, between the Father and the Son, but also their unity. Uh, begotten from the Father from eternity, as the Creed says, is speaking of the mystery of how the Son has existed and yet is in a relationship with the Father. Full of grace and truth. This language of, of uh, grace actually comes from Exodus chapters 33 and 34, where you have the emphasis of Yahweh being full of kesed, undeserved grace and, and mercy, undeserved love. And so here, um, the emphasis is how the Son, who is none other than one with the Yahweh, who appears to Moses in chapters 34 and 35 of Exodus, the one who is full of grace, and I'll just read that very quickly. You have in Exodus 34, uh, the Lord says, I will be gracious, uh, verse 30, chapter 33, verse um, uh, 19. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And then in chapter 34, verse 6, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. Those beautiful words of the, uh, the close of the commandments are, are drawn from uh, Exodus 34. And that's really what's being echoed here. The Son is full of grace and truth. And then you have this language of John testifies. We Saw that earlier in Advent 3, up from uh, verses 6 through uh, uh, 6, 7, and 8 of this prologue, the emphasis of John's testimony. John testified to him and uh, cried out, saying, This was um, the one of whom I spoke. And notice what John says. The one coming uh, after me is actually before me. Again, this is testimony to the pre-existence of the Son. He may have come after John, but he actually predates him because he's within the mystery of the one God of Israel. He's eternal. Uh, he came and, um, and he is prior to me. He was prior to me. So the testimony of John the Baptist to the eternal nature of the Son uh, as um, one who existed certainly was born, in, uh, became incarnate after John was born, but actually existed prior within the mystery of God. Then verse 16, you have, uh, uh, because out of him, out of his fullness, we have, uh, we have received grace upon grace, this emphasis of the gracious God of the Old Testament. We saw it right up here uh, in verse 14 is uh, stressed again, and one in preaching on Christmas Day could really, uh, you know, good Lutheran sermons could uh, pull a lot of attention. In God becoming man, we see God's grace being showered upon all humanity. Undeserved love shown by God coming. Why does he become flesh? So that he could bear our sins in his flesh and pay for those sins through offering that flesh as the atoning sacrifice for all sin of all time. There's where you have, uh, much could be done in unpacking uh, the term charis. And you can see here it comes up again in verse 17. The, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. I think what's being emphasized here is the ultimate revelation of God's grace and truth comes in the flesh and blood Jesus. You see it in the Old Testament, it's testified, but you see it acted out in its most fullest way 
in Jesus, actually living for us, dying in our place, rising again for us. And then finally, uh, it, it closes, verse 18, with the fact that no one has seen God at any time. It's a very, very significant statement. If you read the Old Testament, you see God repeatedly. But what John is saying is, you're seeing the Son in the Old Testament. So nobody has seen the un unveiled mystery of the eternal God. We've always seen him through the Son. But it says, no one has seen God, perfect tense. So in the past, the ongoing result is nobody has seen God, popote, at any time. The only begotten God, another um, variant would be the only begotten Son, but clearly what's being spoken of here is the Son. Okay. The one being at the klopon, the side or bosom, sometimes it's translated, the intimate closeness of the Father, that one, namely the Son, has made him known. Another way to translate that is, has exegeted him. It's the word uh, that we use, the verb that comes from the word that we use for exegesis. He has, um, he has explained him. He has um, brought, made him known. So, what is that saying? Uh, we don't see the mystery of the, the, the whole trinity, but the Son is the one who has made him known all through history climactically in the incarnate Son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is a beautiful mystery to proclaim on Christmas Day, that in this Word who is made flesh, born at Bethlehem is Jesus, we see and know the fullness of God. You want to know God, you don't have to go up to the heavens to find him. He has come down repeatedly in the Son and ultimately, climactically, in the Son who became also flesh, who was born Jesus, the babe of Bethlehem. In that Son, uh, we have the fullness of God and we have grace upon grace. You saw how often that comes. Why did he come? To show the, the undeserved love of God to all humanity by overcoming sin for us. So to really know God, we don't have to go up to the heavens. He's come down to us in Jesus Christ. To know his love, his grace, we need look no further than to this son. A beautiful testimony to, to give to your people on Christmas Day. Uh, as they feel their flesh getting older, wearing out, to see that this is the one who has come to redeem flesh, to show how valuable they are as a creation, how valuable they are including their bodies, that he has redeemed them, their flesh, for all eternity. And one day we'll raise that flesh in glory that may be like his own glorious flesh. We pray God's blessings upon your proclamation on Christmas Day, as you proclaim the eternal word who became also flesh to show the grace of God to this world. God bless you.